Amandas Creativas in conjunction with Seleucia University presents Conversations on the Law. I'll be your instructor, lecturer, moderator, leader, facilitator. You can call me whichever that applies to you. Uh, in terms of full-time engagement, I'm an employee of Seleucia University, where I've worked for more than the last 15 years or so. Man, it's been a while. And my current engagement is as the Deputy Registrar of the University. And um, as far as my education is concerned, I hold a Bachelor of uh, English, a Bachelor of Arts in English and Honours in Laws from the University of London and Master of Business and Administration from Seleucia University. Uh, those are my qualifications and I hope we shall become better acquainted as we go through these tutorials. For now, uh, permission to pray with you, my friends, as we invite the Lord's presence in our midst so that he may give us clarity of mind. Let us pray. And kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of calling upon your name. We are about to go into the study of the law. Dear Lord, you are the lawgiver. You are our judge. How best can we understand the law at least and unless we tap in from you? Dear Lord, as we go into this study, I pray for the viewers who shall be benefiting from this tutorial. May you give us clarity of mind so that we may understand and be able to apply these issues both in our studies and in our day-to-day -day interactions. In Jesus' name we've prayed and asked. Amen. For this week, I'm hoping that we can do an overview of the course. And in this course, we are going to cover, as I mentioned earlier, Business Law 1. And the university has set out about 90 hours of your coursework dedicated towards the study of Business Law. And 45 of these go into Business Law 1, while the remaining 45 go into Business Law 2. So in addressing the issue of business law, the first thing we want to look at is what is business? This sounds like um, a primitive question that you would um, have met at high school or at least in freshman. Now, as you went through high school or even earlier part of um, high school, you, you sought to break this apart and understand it. And I'm sure you have a plethora of... Um, definitions that you can dig up and uh, use those in your response to what business is. Allow me to give um, this viewpoint in the context of business law to say business is um, a description blend of an entity and its activities. So if we're to express this in formulaic format, we would say entity plus activity equals business. But this opens inroads to more questions. The next question will be, what is an entity? What is an activity? And a cursory reading of uh, literature would reveal that. Um, an entity is an artificial person or a legal person or a juristic person. Now, all these big terms simply mean it is an organization or company that is registered and recognized at law. Its registration is what brings it to existence. And its recognition is what sets the parameters of its operations. These are the rights and privileges that will apply to it. Let us use the university as an example. Now, the university is registered as such in terms of a charter of the government of Zimbabwe. This charter is what brings it into existence. But for it to operate, confer degrees, give exams, give course content, define its curriculum, all these are the parameters. Now, when it operates within those parameters, it then confers degrees, and that particular privilege is not vested in all institutions of higher learning. You may have some that are not registered. You may have some that are registered, but they're not recognized. Now, we want to go back and say, if we're talking about the privileges and um, the rights that go with recognition, let's give this as an example. A typical example, let's say you have a bank. A bank is registered as such in terms of the Banking Act. But imagine a situation whereby the bank begins to issue degrees in finance and accounting. 
because it is a financial institution. In as much as it may have people who practice finance and accounts on a day-to-day basis, they eat and drink figures, they still cannot confer degrees. They may be much faster and even sharper than your lecturers, but never, they'll never confer you with a degree. Now, go for your, 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 your astute lawyers in, in, in your law firms. They are there, and, and their business basically is to take on clients, appear on their behalf in court, and of course, bill you. Hmm. Now, those lawyers, even though they're sharper than your lecturers, they will not give you a business, a, 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 a grade for your business law. I'll give you that grade. Now, even a lecturer who may have a clearer understanding of business law would not go on and represent you in a court. They are a lecturer. They are in the classroom. So this has to do with recognition. And the next thing you want to look at is the activities. What are these activities? An activity is a lawfully supplying um, demand for goods and services. So there must be a meeting of this demand and the one who demands it must be satisfied. And this whole transaction must be in exchange for a profit. So there are things we want to, to stress here. It must be a legal transaction. It doesn't necessarily mean everywhere where there is a need, there is a, a demand for goods and services. When you meet it, it becomes legal. No, 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 no. It is just a transaction. It is not legal per se. So where does legality come from? It must come from one's registration. It must come from being recognized as such. And of course, in meeting these particular demands, there is a convergence area. We're going to discuss this later. The convergence area is there must be a meeting of the minds. We'll discuss more about the meeting of the minds as we go into contract law. And there must be a satisfaction where the parties are happy. And in return for the goods and services, they must, of course, part with value. That is the consideration. So in a nutshell, the activity basically becomes lawfully meeting and satisfying a demand for goods and services. We shall go into this as we realize that not all transactions are legal, even though they may meet and satisfy a demand. These are things that we cannot run away from. But let us exert more energy um, looking at business entities in greater detail. Now, in understanding a business entity, you know, we've already said a business entity will be an artificial person, a juristic person, or a legal person. Now, we want to work our way from the known to the unknown. Let us start with myself and yourself. What are we in this greater scheme of things? We are not juristic persons. We are not artificial people. We are real people. So we are referred to as natural persons. That's what we are. Now, when natural persons come together and are registered, combined, this is how they form an artificial person. They form a juristic person who has a right to hold property, who has a right to sue in their name and be sued in their own name as well who has a right to even supply and deal in business as per the registration papers and the recognition they hold. So these are things that we need to understand as we set off. Now, these people who can come together and form this an artificial person or this juristic person, it is not an open-ended number of people. First of all, I can think of their age restrictions that are prescribed at law. People before, below a certain age cannot become members of a corporate body as shareholders. Secondly, people of a certain standing cannot even enter into business transactions. They may be proscribed on uh, grounds of being vagabonds. They may be proscribed on grounds of... Um, you know, some, some misdemeanor in business practice. So you could have a situation where someone is banned or, or someone is um, restricted by law to hold certain offices because of their standing before the court. You could have a situation whereby uh, maybe thirdly, 
that there are certain industries where business is uh, limited to people of certain nationalities. These are your affirmative action kind of decisions. So where the government has decided that certain people will be allowed to trade in this particular industry. So it is not an open-ended kind of uh, scenario that when I think about it, I'll just do it. Whatever comes to mind, that becomes my next business. It doesn't work that way. Now, for all these businesses to come into existence, their birth certificate, their mother, the parent act that brings them into existence is the Companies and Other Businesses Act of 2020. What I have decided to summarize as COPIA 2020 for ease of reference. This is the instrument that gives birth to business entities, which are also known as juristic persons. Now, we also want to look at the examples that come from this parent act. First of all, you can give birth to a company. Secondly, a private business corporation. Thirdly, a syndicate. Fourth, a partnership. And lastly, an association of persons that has a business character. You shall discuss these in much depth in business law too. Now, the Parent Act, COPIA 2020, also brings about um, an avenue for other laws to come into existence. It doesn't contain all the laws, but when you look at it, it will show you that the law is um, an interplay of um, other laws. For example, uh, Section 21 and Section 248 of um, COPIA 2020 mandates that in the Articles of Incorporation, these are the documents that basically bring the business into existence. This business must have a place of operation. And the technical term for this is domicilium. Domicilia, like that's Italian, where you reside, where you operate from. So when you're going to find that in your contracts, your standard contracts, you find words like domicilium, uh, executandi, um, sentandi, and all that stuff. Now, um, what that simply means is that this is the place where you're going to receive your legal correspondence. So when you are in this business, you should have a place of operation. And what does having a place of operation mean? If you're operating in a town, which is the logical place to situate your business, maybe the most expensive, but it's the logical place, that's where business operation takes place. This now gives leeway for the municipal bylaws to come into existence. Not only do, do the municipal bylaws come into existence where you have to pay the rates for, for water and refuse collection and things like that, you may find that you have to own property. So when you own the property on which you operate, now property law comes into effect or land law in other words. So in terms of the property law, for you to then own that land, it must be registered as such. You must hold title to it. And where you're not holding title, you may be renting, as most entities tend to rent. And if you are renting premises as um, someone who's leasing, that is still an interest in the property, and that still leaves us in property law. You could have a situation where you're a startup, you, you go and bank up with your uncle, your aunt, or your parents, you buy a little small corner, that's where you're operating from. You are not leasing. In that case, you are a licensee, you have been licensed to operate from there. So when you are operating as a licensee, there are laws that come in there and the contractual laws, agreements that apply will always revive and subsist for the duration of the contract. And of course, there's a proposal of uh, um, the refuse that you would uh, have to look at. And you may also look at situations on, depending on what kind of uh, industry you're into. If you're manufacturing uh, hazardous chemicals, there's the Environmental Management Act of 2005. Those will come into play. And of course, the tax laws. If you are to continue to operate and be recognized as a registered institution, there are tax laws that you cannot run away from. Company tax that you have to pay if you are operating on um, a far removed place, there is land tax that you'll have to pay. For example, we are operating Solis University on a farm. We have to pay the land tax. And there are, of course, the statutory returns that we shall be looking at later on. 
that you have to return so that you are compliant as far as your employees are concerned and as far as your operations are concerned. Now, let us look at some of the issues that can come up as you look at um, dealing with people under the COPIA 2020 and the exceptions that will apply to them. In your business management principles, I think it's, um, is it management 155? You, you must have done, um, in, in your introduction, when you look at that uh, basic interpretation or description of what management is, and came to the conclusion that management is achieving goals through people. Now, you must have gone on to discuss the, the five pillars of management. I remember mem memorizing them and uh, reducing them to block. I'll also recommend that uh, as you go through business law, find ways of, um, you know, abbreviating some of these things so that you understand them. There, there, there are some um, terms that are unique to a, to, a, um, to a field of study that you cannot um, avoid. You just have to know them. So in management, we say there was block. P for planning, L for leading, O for organizing, uh, was it C for um, uh, control? So when you go into management and you apply block, it, it, it's either you're operating at a planning stage, leading, organizing, or controlling. Now, as you looked at this, the issue at the end of the day was you were trying to manage people. So this is where your human resources will come in. But in COBIA 2020, there are basically three types of people that you're going to find. First of all, there's the entity itself that seeks to manage these people. And in the groups of these people, you're going to find that there are other service providers. These are suppliers. Now, the suppliers are not necessarily your employees. These are people that you deal with on a contractual relationship. So these two, yourself and the suppliers, are under the ambit of COBIA 2020, because you are equals. So COBIA 2020 regulates how you're going to operate. And it also does recognize that there are some people uh, that you may interact with as suppliers, but who would not necessarily be covered by COBIA. They are an exception, like the government. So if you are going to be having tenders with the government, uh, COBIA 2020 might not apply. You may have to look for another instrument that would apply. Now, you're going to, going to have um, the other set of people would be your customers. Those will not be covered by COPIA 2020, but they are covered by the Consumer Price Act of 2019. So that's another act altogether, but you're going to find yourself interacting with these people, either as suppliers or as consumers. And within your entity, you're also going to have uh, a separate set of people that you're going to deal with, and these are your employees. They may be directors, they may be section managers, they, they may be ordinary members of staff. In, in, in dealing with these, you're going to have to look into the Labor Relations Act of 2006 and um, even other statutory instruments that come into play. Now, particularly as you come to the issue of um, operating your enterprise in a business sense, managing people and achieving things through people, whether they're suppliers or whether they're consumers or they are your employees. There are regulations that apply and you cannot um, wiggle your way out of them. Some of these are the mandatory statutory tax deductions, such as pay as you earn. Now, if you are an employer, you will just have to deduct, pay as you earn. And these are monies that are, are, are channeled towards the state coffers. And um, if you are running um, a, a shop, for an example, you're going to have to deduct the value added tax. Uh, you always add that to every um, price that you're going to, to levy upon the consumer. Why? Because those are the, the laws of the state. And um, before you even leave your employer-employee relations, you're going to deduct uh, levies like your AIDS levy and your social security deductions. Uh, all those are, are deductions that apply. And uh, for those of you who will be taking human resources, employment law, you're going to find these and you'll bump into them. And um, even some instruments can be, even though they are not at a legal level, you can also have them internally, like your disciplinary codes in terms of um, 
is it section 101 of the Labor Act, those are going to be internal. And you can have your, I think the 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 the, the, the statute, I mean the, the the one that is the national one of 2006, I think it's uh, statutory instrument 15, SI 15 of 2006. I'm not, I'm not sure about that anymore. I haven't done this labor, um, labor stuff in a while. But um, there are also retrenchment instruments that you're going to be looking at. And all these come together and they affect the operations of an entity. There is no way you can say the instrument that applies to me is just copy year 2020. You're going to find yourself interacting with CPA 2019, interacting with the Labor Relations Act, and even the COP year 2020, and above all, the constitution of the nation. Now, let us go on. Now, we've looked at the business entity. I think at this point, we should be able to move on to business activity and say, what is business activity all about? Now, let us go back. We said activities ought to be legal. There ought to be a combination of um, a lawful supplying of uh, goods and services in exchange for a profit. So once an entity is registered and recognized as a legal person, it is thereby authorized to engage in activities which are uh, antecedent or apply to a legal person and the reason why this juristic person was formed. Now, maybe just to ventilate a bit here. Now, imagine a situation whereby we want to uh, delineate that not all activities are legal. We may have uh, a need. This is um, a demand for goods and services. Let's uh, look at an example where um, we have a situation, I'm not sure what the, 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 the bank rate is, maybe it's around one is to 82 or 85 uh, US dollars there about. Now, people have a demand for the United States dollar and they wish to get it at the highest rate possible. Now, the bank is offering about 80 to 90 dollars currently. Now, you have a situation where there is somebody who says, you know what, with so many people who are seeking after this dollar, I could uh, get this money. And there is this demand, and I can meet this demand at 115 bond or 130 bond. And now this person comes to meet this demand. As they do so, what you do now you pay the 130 bond in exchange for the US dollar value. That is a transaction. But is this person registered as somebody who can deal in money? Forex exchange, which is foreign exchange, by the way. That's what Forex means. Foreign currency exchange. So if you are registered to deal in foreign currency exchange, surely then you have a legitimate business. But all these people that you meet in town, they move around and they, and, 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 and they actually flag you down in certain places in town and ask you to, to part with the US dollars in exchange either for bond notes, rands, or even for eco cash value or the other way around. That kind of an activity in as much as it is a transaction is not legal. It's not legal. You could find yourself actually apprehended and, and, and summoned to the courts if, uh, uh, if, 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 if you find yourself in, in that unfortunate situation. The fact that you had an agreement, the fact that you had this transaction, it, it does not necessarily make it right. So in, in meeting these um, kind of demands for goods and services, they ought to be legal transactions at all times. The fact that they are contractual does not make them legal. So a contract that is unlawful is still illegal. Now, this brings us to the next question where we asked, that, we asked what is business? Now, it is only logical that we consider what are goods and services. And these are ably identified in the Consumer Protection Act of 2019. This is what we referred to earlier as CPA 2019. And the CPA 2019 gives us basically five examples of goods and five examples of services. I wish for you to commit these to memory. I'll just go through them uh, briefly and I'm sure you, you, you're going to find it easy to follow. The first one is anything that is marked for human consumption. 
anything marked for human consumption. So whether it's your minimal sugar, um, uh, cooking oil, that's consumption. And let's go on. Remember, this is low. I'm, I'm starting from the known to the unknown. Um, you have your, your 500 meals of um, lotion, cosmetics. You have your 100 meals of deodorant, perfumes. You are consuming them as they go down, even though they're not going through your mouth. That is still marked for consumption. So anything that you deplete, anything that you use over an extended time, that's consumption. It doesn't necessarily mean it. Consumption simply means anything that can be used by human beings. And B, any tangible product not referred to in A, including any medium on which anything is or may be written or encoded. So anything on which we can write. What can we write on? For example, typically, we write on paper. So if you were to access my um, notes and I've printed them out, spiral bound into a lovely book, guess what? I have written it on a tangible medium. And when you take this, it is a good. If you uh, pay fees and the university provides modules, that is tangible. It's a good. Let's look at another example. Anything that it can be encoded into. So if we can encode and we want to encode onto, um, for example, a cell phone. If you can type onto your cell phone, you're encoding data. If you can take photos, you're encoding data. If you can record a voice audio, you're encoding data. Motion graphics, you're encoding data into it. If it is marked, it is tangible. We can hold onto it. We can fill it. It is palpable. It is a good. And a point number three, any literature, music, photography, motion pictures, games, information, data, software, code, or any other intangible products written or encoded on any medium or license and such intangible projects are considered as goods. Allow me to just skip through this one. I'll come back to it and give more detail on it. Let's go to number four, D. A legal interest in the land or any other immovable property other than interest specified in sections three, subsection five of the CPA 2019. Now on legal interest, I explained this earlier, but I want to just run over it again. On legal interest, you want to take note that the legal interest would apply to a situation whereby you are leasing, you are renting property. That is considered a legal interest. A situation whereby you were, someone has taken a loan and the loan um, rights, you, you know, you actually uh, have a caveat against your, your title deeds. So what someone does is they go to the deeds office and there's a caveat on the, um, a stamp of some sort that they put on the title deeds that this particular property cannot be disposed of before this person pays up. So before this person pays up, there is an interest that must be met. So that particular loan, which is the caveat, becomes a legal interest. So in as much as there is a legal interest on the land, that interest, even though it's artificial, is a good because it has value. And in E, we have gas, water, and electricity. You'll notice that these are utilities. And even though they are utilities, they are still a good. They are consumables, but they are a good. Now, allow me to then go on to item C as promised and so that we can delve into intellectual property, which I think is much more interesting. Now, let us revisit um, item C under the goods. I'm, I'm sure you have noticed that the classification of brutes, goods is so broad that almost everything can fit in there, whether it be tangible goods or intangible goods. Now, uh, item C would be of particular interest to those who are into IT or content creation. Now, you'll notice that in your content creation, you would have a software, but your software is made up of uh, different codes, various codes. Now, your software like your, your Windows, uh, Windows 10, your Microsoft Office, 
Uh, it could be your Premiere Pro or any software you have. There is code that runs behind that software. Now, the software is licensed, but the code is not necessarily licensed. So you could have a situation where a software producer comes up with a software which has been developed by various programmers doing their programming work, whether in Java or in C++, whatever system they're using or, or CHAM. Now, when these programmers come together and they put all this thing together, a software is what is going to be licensed. Now, the programmer who may not have produced the entire software has a risk. The risk is you produce a bit of the software and you have no claim to the software as it were. Now, what should happen is you need to make sure in your information systems, which you can cover in EC200, you keep this at the back of your mind. As the business player I am, how am I going to protect myself? How am I going to protect this code that I've done? And for you to protect that code, it is imperative for you to then patent it so that it is known that this is particularly your code. This is your work. Um, it, it doesn't immediately come to mind, but I, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, there's um, a case that was in the courts for a long time in South Africa, where uh, the gentleman who, I think he developed the code, the please call uh, alert for, for the phones or something like that. And um, that gentleman was not paid. And there was a dispute about the, the monies that were supposed to be paid and, uh, you know, and all that stuff. So you, you want to guard against that when you are in content creation. And in the Zimbabwean context, in, in spite of, um, you know, regardless of uh, the Consumer Price Act, Consumer Protection Act, you also want to look at your acts like uh, the Intellectual Property Act of uh, 2001, as read with other um, appropriate enactments, such as the Trademarks Act, Trademarks Act uh, of 1975, the Industrial Designs Act of 2001, um, as amended, I think, in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm sure you get the point. The, the issue is acquaint yourself with all these acts that are going to protect your goods and your content creation to make sure that everything you post, it takes time, it takes energy. It takes years to learn and acquire some of these skills. You need to be appropriately remunerated for all the work that you put in. That is the work that is in your hands. And even as you go and look at these goods, surely, surely, you ought to benefit from that. Now let's roll over to services. The services are also covered in the Consumer Protection Act 2019. And basically, it is the rights of benefits provided under an agreement for the performance of work, whether with or without the supply of goods. Underscore this, with or without the supply of goods. What this immediately brings to mind is that service is independent of goods, but goods are dependent on service. Now let's go back to communication and academic writing. Remember in your research work, even in methods of um, research, there is the independent and the dependent value. So when you're looking at the independent and independent values, the independent and dependent values, what is independent is that thing that remains constant regardless of what happens. What is the dependent value is the item that changes whenever the independent one moves. So the dependent one leans on the independent one. I hope I have managed to give you a refresher. So when you go into your research, whether you're doing undergrad or postgrad, the concept still applies. When you're doing your master's research, your independent values are those things that they can change regardless and things go with them. And even when they are changing, nothing happens to the dependent values. They can do so um, on their own. But the dependent values cannot remain the same. Whenever there is a move, a change in the dependent value, the independent, in the independent value, the dependent value is going to follow suit. It always tracks and follows it. So when you come to goods and services, the services are independent of goods and goods are dependent on services.
So in your production and operations management, this is what you're going to cover. It's a course you're going to do later on for some of you. So what, what it means is that when goods are being produced by the entity, by the business uh, organization, they are being created and they are going to be held as inventory. So from the point of creation to inventory, they are still goods of the organization. It is only as they are moving from the organization to another supplier or from the organization to the consumer, that kind of movement hinges or rotates or is mounted on a service provision. So these goods cannot be converted from inventory to cash without a service. I, I, hope, I hope this makes sense. I hope it makes sense. So the point to note is that services are independent and goods are dependent. And for them to move across the floor from goods of the company to goods of the consumer, goods of a supplier, at that point, money must transact. There must be a consideration. There must be a price. There must be an exchange. There must be a profit. So remember when you did your principles of accounting, now, it sounds like you're doing all the courses. Remember, it's an, it's an overview of business here. Now, in your principles of accounting, we learned that there are two types of assets. You had the liquid assets and the fixed assets. Now, um, your simplistic definition was that your liquid assets are those kinds of assets that are inclusive of cash or can be easily converted into cash. Your fixed assets are either immovable assets or assets that you cannot easily convert into cash. Now, you also learned that there was what we called um, a combined statement where you're going to have your cash flow statement and your combined statement, which is supposed to account for these fixed assets. So the movement between the liquid assets and the fixed assets and vice versa is inevitable. So accounting is about tracking those movements. How much of the liquid assets do we hold? How much of the fixed assets do we hold? How much of the fixed assets have converted into liquid? And how many of them have converted from liquid to fixed? So when you convert liquid assets to fixed assets, when you buy property, you are using cash that is held in the bank. So that conversion of cash into a house, that is called a capital investment in accounting. Now, when you do the reverse, where you now dispose of a house in order to have cash or to meet a cash debt, that is what is known as um, liquidation. So when you say a company is under liquidation, what it simply means is that a company is moving from fixed to liquid assets, but it is not going to hold these liquid assets. They are going to be given to the creditors. I hope I hope I have uh, tried to simplify your accounting one 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 fundamentals of accounting the way I understood them. So the evolution basically from liquid to fixed and the disintegration from fixed to liquid is dependent on a service, and this service that has to be carried out cannot be carried out without an exchange of a considered price. What is the price? The price is basically the cost of production. After the cost of production, your markup, which is your profit, all together, a price. When that considered price is paid, then the transaction is considered to be complete when goods are exchanged. This already opens inroads to an agreement. Remember, we say it is a meeting, a demand for goods and satisfying that need. So meeting it, this is where the contract is. There is a meeting of the minds, meeting of the minds. And secondly, besides the meeting of the minds, there is the satisfaction that comes together. So this particular satisfaction, I wish to explain it using your sets, the ones that we did in Form 1 Mathematics. There was a universal set with that E kind of thing at the top. Was it at the top left corner? 
Math was not my strength. Now that particular set, you imagine that you're going to have three subsets inside. The first set on the left is going to be your business entity. The next set on the right is going to be your supplier. Now these two are dealing at the same level. They are at par, so they are regulated by the Copia 2020 because they are considered to be equal. So they can enter into contracts, they can stand up for themselves. Now where these two sets meet, that is the convergence area. Where they meet in that convergence area, that is where your contract comes in. That is where your agreement comes in. That is where the meeting of the minds is. That is the area of assessment as far as um, satisfaction is concerned. Now, there are people who are not registered as businesses. There are people who are not trading as such, but they work in as consumers. These are in a separate third set. And the consumer set comes in and also interplays and dovetails with these corporations. And as they transact, they are not uh, mandated or regulated by Copier 2020. They are now regulated by the CPA 2019. So if we understand contract law, the study of this contract law is a study of the convergence area. And before we go into discussion of the law, it is fair that we also cons consider the consumer as articulated in CPA 2019. Now, as we move over to the consumer, the CPA 2019 provides for five examples of consumers. And I want us to um, look at these, demystify some thoughts that we may have held and discover a few things. And uh, the first example of a consumer is somebody to whom particular services are marketed. Now, this is a very simplistic definition, but you'll notice something. This particular definition does not require that one should purchase the product or even use the product. So by virtue of receiving information that is supposed to elicit um, your decision in purchasing this particular product, at that very point, you become a consumer. Now, let's give an example. Now, should you have a scenario whereby someone walks into a shop and you find that in this particular shop, they are selling goods that have expired. You have every right to visit the relevant councils and um, seek redress so that you know there is an injunction. There is an interdict so that these people are, are brought to book. They may be fined. They may have to be uh, reprimanded and told to desist from doing such and endangering, endangering the lives of people. And uh, as an aside, as an aside, as a consumer, make it a habit. Make it a habit before you pick things from off the shelves. Just check the expired dates for the quality that they're supposed to, to have is at best before. So if you are buying goods or products afterwards, they, they cease to have that guarantee that they are of good quality. So you can really hold the, 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 the supplier to deliver as per the promise. Now, the second um, type of a consumer that you may find is one who has entered into a transaction with a supplier or a service provider. Now, this one is a gray area because the law is very lenient in its description and its definition. What is required is for one to enter into the transaction, but not necessarily to complete the transaction. But it will be safer for us to say, do not just enter into the transaction, but complete it. It would make your claim even stronger. Now, what is the transaction? Remember, this is a business activity, which we said, it is whereby the supplier provides goods, and services that are needed to meet that demand and satisfy it in exchange for consideration, in exchange for a profit. So what is consideration? Consideration is broken into basically three parts. Go back to your simple business. Number one is the cost of production. You need to reimburse the producer for that. Number two, the cost of delivery, where that is um, re uh, applicable or relevant. And then number three is the markup. That's the profit. So when you're looking at these three, entering into a transaction would basically mean one has made an intention known that they wish to procure the services or to purchase the goods. 
With that intention, the transaction has started snowballing. It has started rolling. Now, when this person goes on to then pay the consideration, pay the price, pay the required fee in terms of the agreement or the published price, when they make the payment, they have completed the transaction. Such a person comes within the ambit of being a consumer. And now at item number three, this one is more interesting. Item number three says, this is a person who is a user, a recipient or beneficiary of those goods or services. So this person did not purchase. This person may not have received these services of marketing. They are a beneficiary, most likely who has never even visited the establishment where these services are offered. Now, I'll give you an example. There used to be, some time ago, I don't know if they're still there, uh, organizations that would offer insurance. Now, where you can save up and make deposits towards university or uh, high school tuition for your children. And at the point when these children reach that age, they become eligible to claim as beneficiaries. Such a person is a third party to the contract, is a beneficiary, and they have every right to come in and seek enforcement that the promise be delivered and made good upon. Now, um, let's try item number two as an example of item number three as well. Now, the second example, let's look at a situation where you have received a gift and this gift may be a, a cell phone or a laptop. And as you are using this particular gift, it so happens that it malfunctions. As it malfunctions, catches fire, damages some goods of yours. The fact that you didn't purchase it in person does not preclude you from claiming reimbursement or even replacement. By virtue of being a beneficiary who has received it as a gift, you are within the ambit of the law to claim restitution. Now, let's look at the last one. This one will blow your minds away. Now, give a situation whereby you're in the hostels and a friend of yours is using some cosmetic product and you get there and you ask, may I use this product, maybe some skin lightening cream for the ladies or some deodorant? Now, this particular uh, product does not have a disclaimer. And as one uses this product, lo and behold, two, three days down the line, boom, you have volcanoes and, um, and pimples all over. You have turned literally into a leopard. And by virtue of being a user, you can still go and claim reimbursement, claim restitution, and seek to be compensated for the damage you'd have suffered. Now, all these are types of uh, consumers that you can look at. Now, let us look at item number four and five. These are just going to breeze through. On number five, it's someone who purchases or offers to purchase goods or services supplied by an enterprise in the ordinary course of business. And this includes a business person who uses the product or service supplied as an input into his business. Now, you remember in our set that we discussed earlier, these are people who are in set B. Those are the people who become consumers as well. So when they come in and they purchase goods from you, even if it is a product that feeds into the final product, they are still consumers in that sense. And then let's look at number five before we wind off. Any person who purchases or offers to purchase goods or services, otherwise than for the purpose of resale, but does not include a person who purchases goods or services for the production and manufacture of any or other goods of sale and production of other services for remuneration. This is straightforward. So the person must um, purchase otherwise than for purposes of resale. For purposes of resale. Now, these would um, have to prove that whatever they purchased was supposed to build into the final product. So if you are purchasing for purposes of resale, that is a bit of a gray area. I'm talking about those people who are purchasing bales to go and resale 
Should you purchase it and uh, it's all neat up and closed and you discover all shirts are half and uh, the, the full trousers are three quarters, whatever you thought you were supposed to purchase. Surely you can claim it's not fit for purpose, but if you're purchasing it and it's in a closed sack, tough luck. You're purchasing for resale. So I'm, I'm not sure what you think about that. Let's um, discuss it a bit and uh, let me hear what you have to say in the comments below before we wrap up. Now, my friends, having come this far, let's wrap it up. What have we submitted so far and hopefully land and we're taking away? Uh, first of all, we have sought to have an overview of the course business law. And we have looked at the first part of this uh, title, this business. That's what we have been looking at all along. And uh, next week, hopefully, we should be looking at um, in our next installment on um, the law. Now, put together... Business and law, that's what we will be looking at, uh, hopefully within the next seven days or so. Now, thereafter, at number two, we sought to investigate what is an entity. And this is where we looked at, if you remember, Copia 2020, that's the parent act that brings every business into existence in Zimbabwe. It is also the kind of uh, act that would otherwise... Um, give it uh, status of recognition and uh, parameters of operation. So, except, of course, for some of those entities that may be exempt, that would not be covered under COPIA 2020. But for the purpose of our study, we're just um, confining ourselves to COPIA 2020. And uh, the businesses that you'd um, find here, those be like your public companies, private companies, cooperatives, or even any other um, cooperative that is analogous to a business uh, in terms of its practice and the way it transacts. As long as it's registered, it will come under that. And um, number three, we looked at goods. And on uh, goods, this is where now we looked at the Consumer Price Act uh, for the definition of goods. And there were very interesting issues we looked at. You would remember we looked at the intangible goods and we looked at the tangible goods. We looked at goods that can be consumed by human beings and uh, the consumption being eating and use, spending. Anything that you can consume in any figurative term becomes a good. So um, I hope you should be able to remember these and even apply them in an exam situation and identify them. Now, um, the other thing that we also looked at besides the tangible and the intangible goods, we also looked at the aspect that um, the goods are dependent on services. And services are independent of goods. So while um, we did not delve much on these services, we are going to look at these when we go into contract law. Now, our services are what act as a bridge that help the goods to metamorphose, to morph uh, from being liquid to being fixed assets. And we call that capitalization, the capital expense. And for them to move from being fixed to being liquid, that's liquidation from your accounting terms. So that's what we looked at. And uh, lastly, we also looked at a consumer. And uh, this we covered, this one is at least more recent. You should remember that. On the consumers, we covered the five types and they're also covered in the Consumer Price Index. Sorry, the Consumer Price Act. The Consumer Price Act. Now, of all these items that we have looked at, uh, may I submit to you that this was just an attempt at defining business an overview, actually, of business. Um, a study of this course, you're definitely going to need a minimum of four years. I mean, four good years just to study what business is. And we have had to try and uh, compress it into one hour, just an overview. And I hope it has been helpful. But even as we look at it, this has not been an exhaustive study. And uh, secondly, besides it being inexhaustive, we have also had to rely on other uh, disciplines which are not business as it were. We had to go into the law in order to get a clearer definition of terms. So that even as we go into a business law study, it becomes much clearer what we are looking at and trying to compress into these 45 hours. And secondly, in our next installment, when we now look at law, law on its own is supposed to take about five hours, I mean five years of study 
uh, for you to say, wow, I think I've got a, an idea what it's all about, the grasp of it. So this is the other part that we're also trying to fit into this 40, 45 hours. So do stick around. Do not uh, check out as yet. We still have to meet in another installment where we are now going to go into the law so that when we establish our bedrock, we are now going to be moving at a faster pace. When I now make reference to these um, overview kind of statements, it becomes easier for us to relate and appreciate what we're talking about. My dear friends, it's been good hanging out with you in this um, conversation on the law. I hope you have found it helpful and I hope the good Lord is going to help you. Permission to pray with you as we come to a close. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of having considered this study on business law. We have learned about services that must be registered, services that must be recognized, as services that must be done by known businesses. How we pray, dear Lord, that even our activity on earth may be known in the heavens above, may be recognized in the heavens above, May we be known and our names be recorded in the book of life. Dear Lord, we pray and ask, keep us registered and do not delete our names. This has been our prayer of faith until we meet again in the next installment. Bless me, bless the viewers, and bless the students. In Jesus' name, we've asked and prayed. Amen.